based on a biblical foundation of love. If you recall, he talked about how people use 1 Corinthians 13 in a variety of ways. Sometimes it's used in weddings. Uh, a couple might recite it to each other, or the minister or somebody will read it. It's okay. He says that it's been used over and over again as a, a sermon outline on unconditional love. That's not why Paul wrote 1 Corinthians 13. Praise the Lord. We can't teach it. We can't preach it. But that's Paul didn't sit up and think, you know what? I'm going to give future generations of teachers and preachers uh, some teaching and preaching material. That's, that's not why he did that. He's dealing with a problem laden, laden and laced church who are competitive, who are jealous, who are envious, who are in conflict with each other, who are trying to promote themselves over each other because of the gifts that they have. And Paul says, okay, if you want the best gifts, I encourage them. He says, King James Version, covet earnestly, that is passionately, the best gifts. Right? And yet, I want to show you a more excellent way. Seek to have the best of the best. And I'm going to now tell you about something that is better than the best. And that is, of course, what? Love. So he's saying to us, it wasn't about something romantic for couples in a marriage to read to each other. None of that. Because it is actually a totally different kind, a totally different kind of love. And it would be a wonderful thing if every couple that got married were committed to each other, first of all, as believing Christians. You've heard me teach it, preach it before, may I do it again in one line or two. If you can't treat your spouse, your children, your parents like a Christian, you can't expect anybody to. If your spouse doesn't see you as a Christian, behaving as a Christian, what do you think they will expect to see? I'm talking about if you claim to be a Christian. Okay. Its original meaning was to demonstrate how church members, that word church members should be in there, members, relate to one another. Right? Paul says that's it. That's the solution for the competition. That's the solution for the conflict. That's the solution for the arrogance. That's the solution for the feelings of superiority of those who have this gift, that gift, or the other gift. Then this line, if we could just abide by the principles of the love chapter, we would have completely healthy churches. It would be a revolution. Anybody able to say amen, Dr. Rainer? Let's read this one together. One, two, three, read. We are not to love fellow church members just because they are loved. We are to love the unlovable as well. We are not to pray for and encourage our pastors just because they are doing things in life. We are to pray for and encourage them when they do things in not life. We are not to serve the church when the others are joining the we are to serve the church even if we are among the of such. Church membership is founded on love. Authentic, biblical, unconditional love. Do you like those words? Authentic, unconditional, biblical love. It's got to be real. It's got to be real. Not 
makeup love. Talk about cosmetic. That you make yourself look like something you really ain't. Not hypocritical love, right? Not love that you don't know what it actually is. It's got to be unconditional. You know, you've heard it more times than you care to remember. The love that the New Testament challenges us to have is a God love. Right? The God love. Is that simple? And the best definition of a God love is unconditional love. It is love that is experienced, and that is shared out of the heart of the one who loves and is not determined by the lovability of the one who is the target of that love. The truth is, much of the time, the people that we love and the people that need a God they love aren't very loved. And they're not very lovely either. <laughs> All right. I, I, you know, Pastor likes a variety of translations. So uh, this is this is a part of worship. Uh, let me ask you to stand. It's on your outline there somewhere. This is a responsive reading. Right? In the New Living Translation. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a noise of God or a clanging symbol. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but did not love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I have to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Give abundantly 
and serve without hesitation. That's the Jesus way. Giving and serving. He says, double the italicized word, biblical. Sure, you can remain on the rolls of many churches and never show up or give. Rewind. Back up. Repeat. Sure, you can remain on the rolls of many churches and never show up or give. You can remain an active member in other churches by being a CEO Christian. Christmas and Easter only. <laughs> you can even be a revered member in a number of churches by giving a nice sum to the church each year, even though you never lift a finger in service or ministry. We all know that to be true. He said, but please understand, that type of membership is not biblical membership. That approach to membership is man-made, man-centered, and man-maintained. It is totally contradictory to what the Bible teaches. It has, that should be no place, no place in our churches. Uh, you can read the next little line. Some of you have heard me chat out before. A man in our next training class, I believe, some years ago, stated, he used to be a CME member. Now CME is a branch of Methodism. It used to be called, and they were founded in Jackson, Tennessee. I talked to some of you remember It was originally colored Methodist Episcopal. Then some years later, they changed it to Christian Methodist Episcopal. And when he said that, I thought that's what he meant. That his original membership was in the colored or Christian Methodist Episcopal Church. He said, no, Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter on. <laughs> and we see it happening, right? We see it happening. Uh, watch what happens the third Sunday. <laughs> And that's all right. I'm grateful for everybody that shows up. I'm still trying to figure out, deacons and minister, ministers, how I can convince people that something worthwhile happens 51 other Sundays. Yes. Anybody else have that concern? Yes. Biblical church membership gives without qualification. Biblical membership views the tithes and offerings as joyous giving. There are no strings attached. Biblical membership serves and ministers as a natural way of doing things. Simple. Come across that. We give because the heart of God is in us. We share God's heart. It is the nature of a gracious and loving God to give. Yes, sir. Yes. Thank you very much. Reverend uh, Clark says that this matter of giving that God does and teaches us to do is giving and not looking for anything in return. You give because you have. And it is your nature to give. We're not trying to cut a deal with God. We're not trying to get on God's good side. We're not trying to gain favor. Listen, listen, listen. The minute, the nanosecond that we start trying to earn God's favor, it ceases to be favor. And God is going to do what He's going to do for us no matter what we do. And it is true that we get enriched and blessed in far greater ways because of our obedience and our faithfulness. God rewards that. But there often is a difference in grace and favor and rewards. The rewards, that's 
kind of like a bonus. Right? We who are church members are all supposed to function in the church. The concept of an inactive member is an oxymoron. In other words, it's a built-in self-contradiction. We ought to read that line together where it starts the concept. Real loud, together, everybody. The concept of an inactive member is an oxymoron. Biblically, no such church member really exists. I want you to underline that, highlight that, circle it, do a whole lot of things. And I'm still trying to figure out how it is that people drop out of church completely for no apparent reason. 20 years later, they still claim membership in the church. I had an interesting discussion a few months ago. Actually, a mortician called me about somebody he said was a member of our church. Well, I'm not saying that person is not a member because I've only been here 14 years. So I'll ask around. But I've never heard of that name before. Okay? I don't know all. I've looked over most of the records that we have. I've never seen that name on any of the documents. I've never even heard of that name. So I inquired for some of the senior members. Did you hear what I, how I started? A mortician told me. Yeah. Okay. Well, the end of the discussion was that one of the members who's been here the longest in that senior senior group, I kind of vaguely remember that he and a couple of other people. Well, I'm not sure who that is. I remember them being in a revival service one time. And maybe they didn't go up. They might have gotten baptized. But I would never have seen them in the church again. Pastor, that was long after this. 60 years ago. I'm not trying to be funny. I'm telling you about something that actually happened to me that hadn't been a year ago. Somewhere along the line, somebody in the family said, well, a daughter or son or somebody said, they thought, Okay, I'll leave it alone. That's, that's, that's foreign talk to you all, isn't it? No. That's the millennial generation speaking. Well, that's, that's the, the, the lost generation. Yes. Speaking. Yes. Well, and, some other generation. Well, they don't, they don't come to church, they don't know why. Yeah. And some of that is not just the lost generation speaking, it is that person in that generation speaking, too. Yeah. <laughs> there, there's a lot of that. Uh, one, one of the things you'll discover, uh, how, how many of you, if you're aware of uh, Santa Fe Church in California, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know the church where Joel Osteen is? You know the church where uh, T.D. Jakes is? You know all those churches? Would you believe if I told you that one of the things, when you read things those men have written and other staff members have written about how those churches grow. Would you believe if I told you that one of the main ways they grow is yearly? Not every 30 years, yearly. They clarify their church roles. And if somebody has dropped out, I'm not talking about because they're sick or whatever, but if they dropped out, there's a certain period of time that they've got the staff to do all this too. Frank Houston has missed X number of months. He gets a letter. Do you still 